Hello everyone, welcome to uh, the lecture entitled Pest Management. This information comes from chapter 3 in your core manual. You should be watching this lecture after you have viewed uh, the Natural Pest Controls lecture and the Introduction to IPM lecture. Now we're going to start talking about the information that's in your textbook and start going over some, um, some vital information within your core manual. The first thing that we're going to talk about is what is a pest. And your textbook listed is a pest is any destructive or troublesome insect, animal, weed, microorganism, or pathogen. And when you look at this from an ornamental and turf side, and especially turf grass, what do you think is probably going to be the number one pest that we're going to see? It's going to be your weeds. You know, people want a weed free lawn. Uh, next, they want a disease-free lawn. You know, they're wanting, they're going to want you to apply fungicides to get rid of brown patch if it comes up. Um, they're going to want you to apply insecticides to get rid of um, uh, your invertebrates that may be in your turf grass. So, a pest is anything that's destructive or troublesome, and you know it can be destructive based on an economic value, aesthetic value, or a medical medical value. There's four major types of pests. We have weeds that, you know, to be honest with you guys, we can make a lot of money off of. I'm glad they exist in some of these lawns that people want to pay us to come and uh, spray them. Uh, diseases or pathogens, um, you know, something we definitely don't want to see if we're a nurseryman or if we're a greenhouse operator. We want our, we want our greenhouses and our, our agricultural commodities to be free of, of these guys. Invertebrates. You know, you see it both in lawn care and ornamental side. Um, again, very, very profitable business to be in. So you got to look at it. You got to look at it both ways. Yeah, it's it's kind of bad that we have to spray pesticides for some of this stuff. But then again, you know, it keeps the doors open for a lot of lot of uh, landscape businesses. But your vertebrates, they're going to be your insects. You know, these are your bug guys. Uh, and then your vertebrates, you know, anything with a backbone. Uh, we're vertebrates. Uh, you know, I took vertebrate biology uh, a couple semesters ago at Clemson. I absolutely loved it. It was totally different than I thought it would be. But um, animals that have a backbone is 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 simple enough definition for vertebrates. Invertebrates. You know, you guys are probably studying that in insects and disease. If you're taking that with Miss Warthout this summer, very good, very good class. Um, but you know, it's gonna it's gonna be your bugs. It's gonna be uh, these animals with that hard outer shell. Cockroaches would be an example of, uh, uh, of an invertebrate in your home. So, we know kind of what a pest is now, so what is a pesticide? It is any substance that is used to kill a pest or prevent or reduce the damage that it may cause. And here we see three examples that I'm sure we've all seen in a big box store. Roundup, a non-selective herbicide. If you spray Roundup on any living plant, whether it be an ornamental shrub, tree, grass, you're either going to kill it or you're going to cause extreme damage to it. miracle Grow, a fertilized all-purpose plant food, pesticide. Um, home defense, um, something that you're going to you're going to spray around your home to take care of the invertebrates that uh, may be uh, lurking in your uh, in your cabinets or crawling across your kitchen floor, you want to you want to get rid of those invertebrates. So we've all seen these type of chemicals, uh, and um, you know we're familiar with it. You know what would these be? Would these be general use or restricted use? Well, being sold in a big box store, each one of these are going to be general use pesticides. The homeowner can purchase these and apply them uh, to their property. Some pest management goals and terminology that you guys need to be familiar with. You know, goals of pest management. You know, we want to prevent pests if at all possible. Keep the pest problems from occurring. Uh, a good example of that is in our commercial landscape management side of the business. Um, we always applied a pesticide called Snapshot. You'd buy it like in 40-pound bags. And we had these little dispensers. You would actually just shake it. And we would do that on all of our commercial properties in the shrub beds, you know, like islands and parking lots. Um, you know, a shrub bed up against a building that only had like Nellie Stevens or other types of hollies and some maple trees. Um, and it would prevent weeds from coming up. It actually helped us um, 
applying more pesticides in the future because if we applied the pre-emergent weed control, none of the seeds germinated. Our guys didn't have to take Roundup every time they went mowed to spray for weeds. So it actually prevented the pest from coming up and actually, you know, in the long run, um, was the simpler, most cost-effective way for us uh, to prevent that weeds. Plus, we had a happy client who didn't have any weeds come up in their shrub beds. Suppression, reduce pest populations to acceptable levels. Again, acceptable levels, it's going to be different from each and every one of us. Eradication, we want to eliminate the pest population as if in a, um, a food processing plant. We don't want any uh, vertebrates or invertebrates uh, at all within this food processing plant. So we're going to eradicate them. Some terms to know. Mode of action. How does a pesticide work? Is it a poison? Is it, uh, does, the, uh, does the pest ingest the pesticide and does it kill it? Is it a repellent? Does it, does it keep it from coming around? Or is it a desiccant? Does it, does it uh, dry the insect out? Selectivity. We talked about Roundup. You know, being non-selective. Pesticides may affect many organisms, as does Roundup. It would kill anything that you're spraying on. Or it may only affect a single targeted pest species, <coughs> such as something um, um, like your 2,4-Ds going after broadleaf weeds uh, and, and turf. It's only going to kill things like clover, dandelions. Some of your broadleaf weeds uh, are going to be killed with, with a pesticide containing that, but it's not going to harm your turf grass. Systemic. Some pesticides enter the tissue of the pest, crop or animal, and they're transported within. Your textbook gives a good example uh, of how of how that works, uh, you know, with the arrows actually going inside the, uh, the plant. Contact, the pesticides, they do not translocate within the pest plant or animal. They're staying on the outside. Um, and if you're spraying a plant, uh, let's say you're spraying uh, an insecticide that's contact. Well, that insect's going to have to come in contact with that pesticide before it's going to kill it. Versus if it was systemic and goes through the plant tissues and let's say the insect starts biting the plant, starts eating it, well, it's getting that insecticide in it because it's eating the plant and the pesticide is systemic. It's inside it. Residual activity. The effective lifetime of different pesticides varies from hours uh, to weeks, months, or years. So some of these pesticides that we apply, guys, uh, still may be around a year after application. And then pesticide resistant. Pest population is no longer controlled by a pesticide, usually due to elimination of susceptible individuals by repeated exposure. It's just like me taking Zyrtec. I've taken Zyrtec for years, and you'd, one would think, why did I get in this business as bad as my seasonal allergies are? Um, but I did. I've taken Zyrtec for years. Well, this year, for some reason, it's had no effect. I had taken it. I would actually was taking that plus Benadryl. Still nothing. Talked to the pharmacist after I got my Zyrtec refill, and she's like, try Allegra. And I took the Allegra, and it's helped out a lot better. What it was was my body became resistant to the Zyrtec. It didn't help me anymore. So I need to change it up. Just like some of your pesticides that you're using, these insects can be resistant uh, to the pesticides, and you may have to introduce other pesticides or other different control methods so that that one pesticide doesn't, doesn't, so we're not able to use it ever again. You may want to switch it out and use other methods. Uh, some types of some pesticides. Um, herbicides. That's, you know, primarily lawn care, guys. We're, we're going to spray uh, herbicides in our turf. Roundup is a herbicide because it kills weeds and kills vegetation. Insecticide, um, you know, kills insects and related uh, arthropods. Fungicide is for f fungi. Rodenticide. Is for our rodents. Uh, miticide is for mites. Uh, nematodes are killed by nematicides. And then your mollusk, or like your snails, uh, a mollicide, bacteria by bacteria side. Disinfectants or antimicrobial are used for microorganisms. Um, Piscicide, fish, and there's other, there's other pesticides, ladies and gentlemen, that'll kill fish that are very harmful to fish. Um, that you wouldn't even think. So read the label. Anytime you might be applying a pesticide near 
water and there's a chance for runoff into into a lake or a stream be careful because a lot of these pesticides will harm fish other than just this type of pesticide repellent insects and related organisms birds and mammals uh, desiccant and you know, it promotes the drying especially with the insects growth regulator alters the growth or development of an insect or plant but is not uh, a fertilizer we use atromec a lot on our pruning sites especially large hedges um, one in particular we prune this enormous uh, Eliagnus hedge my dad's done it for years for this client and um, you know we prune it prune it back sometimes we'll apply uh, atromet a growth retardant which will suppress the growth of this plant well the client's son works for the chemical company that, that makes the growth retardant so he's always giving his dad <coughs> giving his dad a growth regulator either we apply it or the homeowner will put it in a backpack and actually spray it but it actually controls the growth of that Eliagnus and if you guys know what Eliagnus is I mean it, it just grows super fast um, very nice smelling plant but uh, sometimes can be uh, very invasive uh, on depending on where you plant it and then pheromones chemicals that affect the behavior of other members of the same species for example moths use uh, pheromones to uh, to attract mates the pheromones are also commonly used to attract uh, insects to a trap so what is IPM well integrated pest management IPM is the coordinated use of appropriated control tactics to reduce pests and their damage to an acceptable level in the previous lectures you've seen a very similar definition guys they're all correct um, and by you guys seeing the different definitions coming from different textbooks you're grasping a, a broader spectrum of, of what is IPM um, this is coming directly from your core manual you know one of the lectures I put up IPM was a little bit different in its definition uh, that came from your ornamentals and turf textbook and then the lecture that I put up on your introduction to IPM was still yet another very similar but somewhat different of a definition either one of them is acceptable to say they're coming from textbooks guys components of IPM the IPM approach can be grouped into six major steps well first we're going to want to identify the pest and understand its biology and as we all know um, not knowing what we're spraying pesticide for is the biggest biggest problem when it comes to, to pest management we don't know what it is um, we've got to identify the pest and coming from a horticultural background guys you're going to be able to notice damage that would actually help you identify some of the pests um, you're going to know the biology with the other courses that you're taking within this program you're going to uh, to know what aphids produce they produce the honeydew so if you see honeydew dripping off um, some of your plants you know that you've probably got aphids um, you're going to want to monitor the pest to be managed you're going to see how many is there to begin with you know the first thing you may want to do if you get a new landscape client is to kind of do a site visit walk through the property look at the plants see if there's any insects on your ornamentals you go back two months later uh, after you've taken over uh, the maintenance of the property see if there's any more increased or see if it's decreased you're going to be monitoring it. then you're going to determine if threshold levels of pest populations have been reached you're going to want to see um, <coughs> you know for one what what is the cost going to be of the the pesticide application well if you don't apply the pesticide are you going to have to replace a hundred shrubs that's on this property which could be very very expensive you know it's more expensive to do that than it is to apply a pesticide but it's going to be up to you and your client to determine what the threshold level is and if the pest populations have reached that then you're going to consider various management choices you're going to want to see um, do we necessarily have to use an IPM I mean do we necessarily have to use a pesticide um, can we introduce a biological control you need to look at all all of your management choices when it comes to uh, uh, controlling that pest 
And then you're going to implement the tactic or tactics that control the pest with the least harm to everything else. You know, you don't want to damage neighboring shrubs. You don't want to damage uh, beneficial insects by getting rid of a an insect that's considered a pest. You want to you want to bring in uh, the procedures that's going to cause least damage to to the whole property uh, as a whole. And then you're going to record and evaluate the results. Anytime you make that pesticide application, you know, hey, May 23rd, did, did we apply pesticides uh, for aphids on this property? You know, we noticed back that it had a few aphids when we first took over the property. You know, we've noticed a larger growing infestation. We've kept track of it. Well, we applied this or we implemented this part of the IPM plan. Here's what happened. You've got a history to go back on. Uh, to see to see if your uh, integrated pest management plan is actually working. All right, overview of integrated pest management. You know, it comes directly uh, from your book. It's a nice little chart, uh, table three point three. You know, but pest identification, the most critical factor in success, successful pest control is identifying the pest. If you don't know what it is, how can you take? How can you control it? Monitoring or scouting. You know, finding pests and taking samples to uh, to estimate their populations. I mean, I like the book's example of the uh, the net by actually uh, going through someone's property and seeing what insects. My dad does that with the strawberry patch. He'll go through with the net, collect, see if there's any types of insects uh, that he's finding in the strawberry patch. Uh, action thresholds or economic thresholds. They determine whether a pest population is likely to cause enough damage to justify the cost of control. Is it going to cost you more money to apply that pesticide than the product you're going to lose or the, the crop that you're going to lose? That's, again, up to you. And then you're going to select the best management option uh, or combination of options for achieving that goal, whether or not it's going to be using natural control, such as predators, pathogens, or parasites, parasites. Is it going to be cultural control? Is it going to be a crop or site management strategy that reduces the numbers or damage? And then sanitation, simple as removing the food, water, or shelter. Um, think of the example inside the home of, of your uh, pet's dog, you know, your pet's bowl food. If you set it in like a little, um, a larger bowl filled with water and you create that moat, you know, your invertebrates throughout the house don't have access to, to that food. You're eliminating it. Um, mechanical control, cultivate disc or mow, removing things by hand, simple as mowing. Uh, will help. And another thing with, with actually mowing your turf grass, the the higher you mow your grass, um, especially in your tall fescue, the less Bermuda grass you're going to have. Bermuda grass needs, <coughs> needs full sun to grow. So if you're growing your turf grass at at least four inches high, it's getting taller, it's going to shade out that Bermuda grass and you're not going to have to implement a pesticide to take care of that. How many times have you seen neighbors that mow their, yawn, mow their lawn and they scalp it? Well, over time, you know, they may have had a blush green fescue lawn, but over time that Bermuda is going to take over because the environment's right for it. It's, you've got that, um, that perfect environment or that something, something is the, uh, the cultural, how you mow it has allowed that Bermuda grass to take over. Um, exclusion, screens, traps, and barriers. Um, something as simple as putting up a screen on your patio will prevent the mosquitoes and flies from coming in on you. Biological control, introduction of predators or pathogens. And then host resistance, uh, naturally occurring or biologically engineered. Think about the soybeans again for Roundup. Um, you have Roundup ready crops. You can actually spray Roundup over top of some of these crops because they've been genetically engineered to be resistant to Roundup. It kills all the weeds around it, but you can spray Roundup on the plant, over the plant itself, and it's not going to damage it. Then you have quarantine and regulatory control. For pests occurring over large areas or endangering public health, uh, government agencies may take action. <coughs> And I don't know. Every time I read about this, I think of the my favorite one of my favorite movies, Quarantine. You know the movie about the 
the Los Angeles apartment building that people became um, in contact with a uh, an animal with rabies and the residents started developing it and then all of a sudden one of the residents takes their animal to the vet and they realize that this an this dog was very very contagious you know he'd been bitten and just turned almost evil well it started happening to the residents well the US government boom they quarantined that whole building um, and that's when that's when the government's gonna take it if it's something that's going to endanger the entire public health they're they're gonna step in and they're gonna either quarantine it or they're gonna do their regulatory control and then last but not least chemical control or the application of pesticides use of the pesticides are either going to kill repel regulate attract or otherwise interrupts the pest um, life or the life cycle and then um, we're going to evaluate and record the results post treatment monitoring uh, to estimate the pest population is important for measuring effectiveness of pest control actions and then keep the records uh, of the results so that you can always look back over them from year to year all right. <clears throat> uh, for a pesticide application to make economic sense or at least break even, monitor the pest population to see if it has reached the economic threshold, the ET. Um, very good diagram in your textbook. And you're going to see that economic threshold, um, sometimes called your action threshold. But you need to monitor your pest population to see if it's reached that economic threshold or action threshold when the cost of treatment can be justified to keep it from reaching the economic injury level. And see so if you can see my mouse here. We have our economic threshold. Well, we have our pest population. As you can see, very low right here. It's on the rise. So we're going to want to, we're going to, want to keep it. You know, we're monitoring it within our IPM as we see. The, uh, the pest population increase and then all of a sudden, boom, it's got a very high spike uh, in the number of pests. Well, we've set our economic threshold below our economic injury level. This is when it's really going to, to cause injury or damage to our pocketbooks, to our crop. You know, this is where we're losing money or people are getting hurt. So we've set our threshold below the injury level. And once this pest reaches this threshold, this is when it's time to treat or apply a pesticide or apply a biological control. Anything that we've included in our IPM plan, this is where we're going to uh, this is where we're going to start using it right here. As soon as the pests uh, reach that economic threshold, because we don't want the pests just to keep boom rising and then all of everything above the, the injury level we're losing money people are getting hurt lives are lost um, we want to keep it below that level right there control strategies natural controls we watched the lecture on natural pest controls you guys are you guys are kind of familiar uh, familiar with this um, applied controls this is pretty much methods that are used by humans. We can introduce biological control uh, using natural enemies, predators. We're introducing it. It's not actually occurring in nature. That would be your natural pest control. But we're introducing the predators and predators in like a greenhouse setting. <coughs> Mechanical control and exclusion. You know, as simple as, you know, caulking around doors and window seals and stuff like that not to allow bugs come in you know screens on the windows we're keeping the pest out of our house um, traps would be considered mechanical you know you see these lights hanging that the bugs fly into and they get like electrocuted mechanical cultural control sometimes the lowest cost option and the best way to prevent future pest infestation would be cultural control. But what we're doing is we're making we're making the environment unfavorable to the pest. Go back to the 
um, Bermuda grass. People always say, well, Eric, how can I get rid of my Bermuda grass in the fescue? You know, I told you a while ago, mow your yard at four inches. Don't mow it at two. Then the Bermuda grass is going to take over. Mow your grass at four inches height, and you're not going to have crap. You're not going to have uh, Bermuda grass. That is a cultural control. Physical or environmental modification. Think about greenhouse setting. You know, we can control that environment. It's kind of hard to do it out in the lawn and landscapes, but we can do it um, in a controlled environment. Um, you can lower the humidity in grains, as the book states. You can use fans in a greenhouse to increase the airflow, which will keep fungal diseases away. Um, genetic control, or, you know, host resistant. Again, the Roundup Ready crops. Uh, you can spray over it. Um, regulatory pest control again. You know the quarantine or large scale eradication. Quarantine. You know keeping the pest in a certain area and not letting them get out. Regulatory. Um, the side of things. Large scale eradication, as in your food processing plants, getting rid of all the bugs and the creepy creatures that crawl on the floor. And then last but not least, your chemical controls or your pesticides. You know, and there's always advantages and disadvantages to pesticides. Your book list is list some, some good ones. Advantages. They're usually effective. They work almost immediately. I mean you're gonna see the weeds start dying pretty quick. You're gonna start seeing the insects die pretty quick. Um, and another advantage is that the pesticide might be cheaper than some of the other IPM strategies. It may be cheaper to apply that pesticide. Some disadvantages, um, you know, the pesticides are going to lose their effectiveness. You know, the plants are going to become resistant to it. The insects are going to be resistant to it. Um, they may, some of the pesticides might be harmful to non-target insects or plants. Um, they may move off site according to drift. But, you know, we know we're not supposed to spray a pesticide when it's windy. So you got some advantages and disadvantages of, of applied pesticides. And then pesticide resistance. Um, good diagram here in your book. Uh, you know, as you can see that, you know, there's going to be a few individuals that are automatically resistant uh, to the pesticide. Well, then he's going to pass on some of those traits to his offspring. And then eventually, if pesticides are applied frequently enough, the pest population will soon consist mainly of the resistant individuals. So the resistance, it can spread pretty quickly through, through a, a population of pests, um, especially ones that have several generations in a year. And then slowly, uh, slowing the spread of resistance is an important part of good pest management. Like I said, don't use the same pesticide. Implement everything that you know within your IPM plan, see if you can bring it in together and not have to use that pesticide. Or when you do use that pesticide, the pest hasn't become resistant to it. It's it's a biology behind it, guys. And, you know, we're just getting started with this. Um, and hopefully you're reading the chapter. You know, you're going to understand a little bit more. Um, as like I always say, you know, if you have any questions about this, please post it to the discussion board. Send me an email. Um, it's it's been a great chapter um, reading uh, about it. Um, hopefully, this lecture helped clarify some of the things. If it hasn't, like I said, I'm I'm always here for questions. Uh, but I would read this chapter. Um, sometimes it's good to read the chapters before. I always like pre-reading. Um, I know some of you probably already read quite a bit of your text. Uh, so when you see these lectures, you're just reiterating what you've already read. So with that, I'm finished with this lecture and uh, we'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.